have to come and smell me later, you know. That'll be good. This morning, we are finally, I shouldn't say it that way, but we're going to wrap up our time in First Peter. And, um, you know, last week, we really wrapped up most of the teaching portion, most of the instruction portion, but there was just something left that we needed to do. You know, I, I, I know this about myself. I am a muncher. I love to munch. And if there's something that is available to munch, I will munch it until it's gone. So I have to always be careful that I'm munching on the good stuff. You know, if there are nuts out, I, I'll munch them. So I try to, to do good so carrots, celery sticks. But I, I know that if, there, if it's something left, I will munch it. It's just there's something about me that says I just can't leave that if there's more to enjoy, which is part of my problem, by the way. <laughs> But you know what, this week I kind of felt that same way with First Peter. We could have wrapped it up last week and moved, moved on to a, a new portion of Scripture. But as I look at this, in a sense, there's just some good stuff left on the table here. There's just some good stuff left in these few closing verses that I just didn't want to pass by. And I didn't want you to pass them by without enjoying these final instructions. In fact, we're going to look just three final phases, phrases here that uh, we're going to look at and just enjoy that. And, and honestly, we could look at these verses and just kind of pass by and say, oh, yeah, that's the, the wrapping up of the letter and, the, and the, the blessing at the end and just some personal notes and there's nothing really important here. But the truth is there's something important here. So we're in 1 Peter. We're in chapter 5. I want to back up. And we looked at verse 11, but there's something in verse 11 we didn't get to. And then verse 12 and following, there's still more good stuff in here that we want to glean. So three things, and in a sense, these are kind of unrelated things, but really great morsels for us to enjoy. Verse 10, you remember that Peter was just giving those finals and final instructions about just being faithful and, and getting our lives in line with God and even in the light of persecution. Verse 10 says, After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And we, we grabbed a hold of that last week with the understanding that, that our suffering and our trials, our persecution, even though that may be intense, in the light of eternity, it's just for a short while. It's just for a short while. And even in that short while, we understand that God is at work. The God of grace is at work in us. He's building us. He, his desire is to strengthen and confirm and, and to build us up. And while the enemy wants to tear us down and destroy us, God is going to use those very things to build what he wants to build in our lives. And then verse 11 says this, To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul, in this wrapping up, says, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. Now, Three things I want to see, and we're going to take these out of order a little bit. First of all, this, this idea, he says, through Silvanus, our, our faithful servant, a brother and a faithful servant. Now, what is that? Why is that important? We could just kind of gloss over that and say, okay, now here's the wrapping up. He's just uh, sending some personal greetings at this point. But I, there's something here, this, this mention of Silvanus. Who is that? And the first question is that we would actually grapple with is when Peter says, through Silvanus, I have written to you. Now, what does that word through mean? Does that mean he's the messenger or he's the scribe? We know that when Paul wrote, we, we've got this indication that possibly there were eye issues with Paul. He couldn't see well, so he would often dictate his letter. So he would have a scribe who would write it down. But we don't have that indication with Peter. So I, I don't think that Silvanus is simply this secretary who's writing this out for Peter. He's not dictating the letter to Peter. I think this is more of a case that this letter was written and delivered by this individual. It was written and delivered by this individual, and I think there was a reason for that. I think he sent Silvanus with a purpose, and 
it was delivered to him for a reason. So if we would understand that, we have to back up and say, well, what was the reason? First of all, who is this guy? Who is this Silvanus? We, you might recognize him by his other name. In the book of Acts, he's called something different. I don't know which one is the nickname. If Silas is the nickname or Silvanus is the nickname. Or maybe they're just variations of the same name. But in Acts, he's called Silas. He's called Silas. And we know a little bit about Silas just from the book of Acts. So let me give you some references and give you just some of his background and his story. We're introduced to, excuse me, we're introduced to him in Acts chapter 15. And in Acts chapter 15, here's the story. Paul has been preaching and presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. But that those early believers and the apostles in Jerusalem, we understand they were Jewish believers, and there arose some concern. Is Paul preaching the same message that we're preaching? And so Paul comes and presents himself in Jerusalem. It's the Council of Jerusalem. And lays out, this is the gospel. This is what I am preaching. And those apostles, those early church fathers said, yeah, that's what we're preaching too. Keep going, Paul. In that, as Paul presents that and he goes back to minister, they send a small contingent with him. Among the men that they send back with Paul to minister to the Gentiles is this man named Silas. Silas is a Jewish believer who was in Jerusalem, counted as a faithful man by the apostles. He's not an apostle, but he's counted as a faithful man. And he's sent back to minister to Paul. I don't know if he's sent just to kind of keep an eye on that or just to give an account of, uh, a firsthand account of what's going on and how this ministry is thriving and, and how lives are being changed because of the gospel. But Silas goes back with Paul. We're also told at that same time that that Silas has this gift of prophecy, that he himself is a prophet. And that's not necessarily meaning that he predicts the future, not that aspect of prophecy, but he's one who can just describe, he understands and has an insight as to what God is doing. That really is the, the biggest part of the gift of prophecy, just to be able to speak forth and to speak it out to to the general population, to the public, to the people. This is what God is doing. This is what God is about. This is what he's doing in our culture. This is what he's doing in this situation. And Silas has this gift of prophecy. We're told at the end of chapter 15 that when the rest of the delegation returns to Jerusalem, Silas stays. It, we could read into that that he signs on with Paul. He joins Paul's ministry team and becomes one of the, the key players in Paul's ministry. He stays with Paul at Antioch. Chapter 16 of Luke, um, not Luke, of Acts, written by Luke, by the way. Chapter 16 of Acts tells us that, that Paul went to Thyatira. And with him was Silas. And while they're at Thyatira, he's arrested. Paul and Silas are arrested. And it, it just this one uh, little phrase, they were arrested and they received many blows. So they're arrested and they're persecuted. They are mistreatment. You know, the end of that story is they are in the prison having received many blows, having been mistreated. They're in prison. They are chained. And that's when God sends this miraculous deliverance. There's an earthquake. The doors, the prison doors open. The chains fall off. And the jailer is panicked because he's lost all of his prisoners. And Paul and Silas are still there. They have an opportunity to lead him to Christ. Miraculous provision. Miraculous deliverance. Silas is part of that. Acts chapter 17, he's in Thessalonica with Paul, and uh, it heats up again. The persecution, the opposition heats up again. And Silas, along with Paul, escape by night to Berea. And yet the opposers follow them there. And it mentions that, that Paul um, is sent away by the brethren there. He says, it's too hot, it's too dangerous, Paul, you've got to get out of here. Paul is sent away, but Silas and Timothy actually stay in Berea for a season with the instruction, come and join me. Paul says, come and join me as soon as you can. Chapter 18 of Acts, where, where he's mentioned again that he rejoins Paul in Corinth. So just remember these places. He was with Paul in Thessalonica. He was with Paul in Corinth, which really 
gives us an understanding as to why Paul mentions him specifically in the greeting of his letters to 2 Corinthians and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. As he writes back to these churches, he says, Paul, along with Silas, because you know him, along with Silas, Paul would write these letters. So why is it important that we know him? Why should we know him? Well, there's some things about him just from, from that brief history, just from the fact that he's mentioned by Paul in these letters. There are a couple things that we would glean on to here. First is he wasn't an apostle. He wasn't part of the original 12. But even in Jerusalem, I think we could label him as an elder quality leader in the early church. He's an elder quality leader in that early church. And as, as that group gathered in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15, as Paul presents that ministry to the, to the leaders of the church. Silas, Silvanus, is there. He's one of the ones with spiritual maturity, and so much spiritual maturity that he's sent back to minister with and to join with Paul. He's an elder quality leader. But you think about this now, that S Silas, Silvanus, has a long ministry history, not just with Peter, but with Paul. Here are two of the founding pillars of the Christian church, of spreading the gospel. This man has ministry history with both of them. You just kind of put that in modern day terms of being able to rub shoulders with two leading evangelical pastors or preachers. Silvanus was there. He was in Jerusalem with Peter and James and the rest of them, learning from them, fellowshipping with them, having a depth and a richness in spiritual maturity. And then he goes and joins Paul's ministry, and he's learning from Paul and, and being enriched by that. And now, obviously, here at the end, he's back with Peter. So he's got this ministry history with both of these guys. But here's the thing that I think is important. He knew what it was to be mistreated. He knew what it was to be mistreated for the cause of Christ. He was with Paul. He was arrested and accused. He was beaten. He was in fear of his life. There were times they had to run in fear and escape by night. He knew what it was to be mistreated. And so you think about who he is and the fact that Peter now sends this letter. He's just written a letter about the reality of persecution and hardship to the church. And he says, now I'm going to send this. I'm sending this with Silas. In a sense, we, we can almost read into this to say, I, I, I've written to you about, told you the facts, it's on paper, but Silas is going to fill in. Silas is going to tell you what it's like to live that. And you can be encouraged by this one who has lived it. So, uh, again, why should we know that? Well, often with these, and I, and I love to look at the people who are named at the end of letters and so-and-so sends greeting, and Mark sends a greeting, and Silas sends a greeting. And While they may not be well-known, they had impactful ministry. And we, we would say it this way and just understand that, that faithful ministry isn't always noticed, or does it have to be noticed? You can be faithful in ministering and have an incredible impact for the gospel, an incredible impact for the sake of the kingdom of God, and very few people would ever notice that. You may not have the notoriety. You may not be the name that people know and see the face that is out in front, but you can have impactful ministry, and certainly God takes notice of that. It's recorded for us here. We have to do a little digging to find out what was true of Silas, and that's just a basic sketch outline of his life, but God knows that. But here's the thing I want you to take away. I think he was sent for a purpose, and that was so that he could fill in and speak from experience about all the things that Peter just wrote. And here's, here's the application of that. And I, I just want to say it this way, that those who have been have a unique opportunity to minister to those who are. Say it that way. Those who have been have a unique opportunity to minister to those who are. So those who have been persecuted have a unique opportunity to minister to those who are going through persecution. Well, we could plug other things into that, couldn't we? Those who have dealt with devastating sickness have a unique opportunity to minister, minister to those who are dealing with devastating sickness. Those who have experienced heartbreaking loss 
have a unique opportunity to minister to those who are in the moment, in the, in the midst of experiencing that loss. See, God uses those things. I think Paul writes about that, that, that we have that opportunity to comfort others with the comfort with which we have been comforted. When we've gone through that lesson, that experience, and we've seen God at work, God can use us then to minister in the lives of the people around us. And I think that's the very reason why Peter sent Silvanus, Silas, as the messenger, as the deliverer of this letter. To minister to those. He, he wrote, and, and I don't want to say he just wrote in theory, but he wrote the words. Now Silas, Silvanus, is able to fill that in and say, here's how we live it, and you can live it too. Here's how I went through it, and here's how you can live it too. There's a purpose for that. Something else here that I want us to know. Um, this phrase, back, back up to verse 11, to him be dominion forever and ever. There's something about that word that should catch our attention. This is more than Peter just wrapping it up. This is not his sign-off. Don't read this as if, well, that's all I have to say, and now I'm wrapping it up. See ya. It's not a sign-off here. But there's something about this word dominion that I think we should pay attention to. The Greek word that Peter uses here, and I believe that uh, the Holy Spirit moved Peter to write using his personality and his background, and yet even the very words are important. So the word that he selected to use is an important word. The Greek word that he uses here is kratos. Kratos. To him be dominion. Dominion, kratos. And, and that word dominion, that word kratos, first of all, it suggests power. Um, it suggests strength and authority. But at the root of the word, there is this idea of complete, complete. And so if we put that together, when, when we're talking about God, to him be dominion, complete power. He has all power. He has all strength. He is complete in strength. There's nothing lacking in the power of God. But when we say it that way, this, this perfect power, this complete power, kind of backs us up a statement. And I think this is on purpose. So we need to read verse 11 with verse 10. Verse 10 says this. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, and strengthen and establish you. To him be dominion. Here's how I would read this. My paraphrase is just this. He himself will perfect, confirm, and strengthen you. You know why? Because he has all strength. Because that's who he is. He will confirm and strengthen you because that's who he is, because that belongs to him, because perfect strength belongs to him, and because perfect strength belongs to him, he can strengthen you. He will establish you. Why? Because he's perfect. He will perfect you. Why? Because he's perfect. And the idea here, go ahead and, Click that next slide, Zach. Because perfect strength belonged to him. That's, that's it. And when we put those together, we realize, we understand what the statement is. That all that we are, all that we have, everything that is true, should be true about us, is true because of who he is. We can stand and we can live through and we can make it through these times of hardship and persecution, not because we're tough, not because we are resolved, not because we have this personal inner fortitude. We can do this because of who he is. We can be strong. Why? Because he is the one who has all strength, because he is perfect in strength. He can perfect us, not because we allow him to do that. He can perfect us because he's perfect. All that we are and all that we have is because of who he is. Now we back up and, and think about this and think about that in light of what Peter has just said. He's talking about the reality of persecution. He's talking about how we should live in light of that and how we relate to one another and how we live in a world that doesn't love us. But we have to understand that what Peter has just described, this is not an instruction that gives us tools to make it through. This is not a strategy that we employ to live out persecution. 
What he's describing is the relationship that we need to live in. We can, we can endure all that not because we've done all the tools and we have, we've gone to the seminar and we know the steps. We can do that because of who God is. And the key to enduring that, the key to living through that is just be settled and live in that relationship of who God is. And that's why we get in line with. That's why we submit to. That's why we get behind the one who has all power. And because of who he is, we can do these things. It's not just a signing off word here. That he has all power. And all of these things are instruction for us because that's who he is. And all of these things can be reality. Not because we learn to employ them. All of these things are reality because he is God. To him belongs power and strength. And not just power and strength, but nothing lacking in power and strength. All power and all strength and all wisdom. But the thing I want to focus on here is, in a sense, we're going to come back to the place that we started. This is the true gospel of God. We, we looked at this verse when we launched into this study because Peter says, I, this is why I wrote. This is why I'm writing the letter. Here's the purpose. Here's the, here's the mission statement of the letter. Here's the theme of the letter. He says in verse 12, through Silvanus, our faithful brother, so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Here's why he wrote. Because he wants them to understand what the grace of God really is. He wants them to understand what the gospel really is. And when we started this months and months ago, we kind of looked and... and uh, kind of imagined we made some assumptions about what their wrong assumptions were. What wrong assumptions about the gospel were they holding on to, which were tripping them up? One of those wrong assumptions was that in Christ, my life should be comfortable and easy and with no complications. That in Christ, everything should be ease and comfort and maybe even luxury. Because I'm a child of the king of kings, right? Makes sense if we follow that line of thinking. Peter says we've got to correct that. The reality is, I have to correct those wrong assumptions because the reality is, and here's the big idea. Here, here's the big idea. It's on your paper. If we start with the wrong assumption of what the gospel promises, then we will be devastated when the reality of persecution sets in and presses in. Think about this. We start with that wrong assumption that in Christ, I'm promised ease and comfort. That if we have that assumption that my life is always going to be good and easy and there's not going to be any rocky roads, then your faith, your foundation is going to be devastated when the reality presses in. When you face hardship, when you face persecution. Your faith, your whole foundation is going to be devastated when you don't receive the luxury that you thought the gospel promised you. And if we start with that foundation, we're going we're gonna to come to a wrong understanding. And the inevitable consequence of, of coming to a wrong assumption or basing our whole faith, our whole belief system on a wrong assumption, the inevitable consequences are devastating. One consequence would be that that we come to this idea that, well, maybe I missed something. I thought that following Jesus meant that my life was going to be easy. My life isn't easy, so maybe I missed something. Maybe there was a step there that I didn't get to. Maybe there was something that, that I should do. Maybe I should do, there's, there's more of the requirement. Maybe I should do more. Maybe I should try harder. Maybe I should be better. And, and if I just did more or tried harder, or if I was just better, then maybe I would experience that easiness that I thought the gospel promised me. You know what that is? That's works. If I just worked harder, if I just supplemented what Jesus did for me, then maybe I could experience ease and comfort. It's a, it's a wrong conclusion based on a wrong foundational assumption. But even worse, maybe we come to the conclusion that maybe I'm not really saved. If following Jesus means my life is easy and comfortable, and certainly my life is not easy and comfortable, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I don't belong to him. 
maybe the salvation didn't apply to me. Again, maybe I didn't say the words correctly, or I wasn't sincere enough. Maybe I just didn't make it. Maybe God didn't accept me. Maybe I read that promise wrong that whosoever, well, maybe that doesn't include me. Maybe I'm not saved. And even more devastating than that is this ultimate inevitable conclusion maybe I believed in something that was a false hope maybe there really is nothing to this promise of Jesus maybe it was just a bunch of words and I'm no better off than my unsaved heathen neighbor and Vic maybe he's a little better off than I am because he seems to be enjoying the moment and I'm trying to be religious maybe it's all emptiness see if we start with the wrong foundational assumption your life is going to be devastated and your, your faith system is going to be devastated when the hardship presses in. And that's why Peter says, this is the true gospel. This is what I want you to understand. This is the truth about the grace of God and this is the truth about the gospel, about what we have in Jesus, what is promised in Jesus. So I want you to know this. I want to go back. Just look at the promise of grace. Because the promise of grace is the gospel. What is the gospel? What are you promised in Christ? Certainly you're not promised that life is going to be easy. You're certainly not promised that you're going to be prosperous and wealthy and enjoy all luxury. So what are you promised? Well, we go back and look at what was accomplished for us at the cross. When the eternal self-existing God took on human flesh for us for the purpose of going to the cross, what was accomplished? What did grace do there? The goodness, the undeserved favor, the unearned gift of God. What did it do? Well, the unearned gift of God, the grace of God, secured forgiveness for your sin. Secured the forgiveness of your sin. Because, you know, Sin comes with a price, and there is a penalty, and the penalty of sin is death. Your rebellion against God puts you under a condemnation of death. There was a death sentence, and that death sentence couldn't be commuted. It couldn't be, it couldn't be satisfied any other way that there had to be death. But the goodness of God, the grace of God paid that penalty in full it was a sufficient payment to satisfy your sin debt when the self-existing god took on human flesh and went to the cross for you that payment was paid in full and nothing needs to be added to that and nothing can be added to that this is not an idea where he got it started and now you complete it by your good works or the other way around that you get it started and he'll fill in what's missing by his death it's not about you. It's not Jesus and. It's about Jesus. And it was sufficient payment for your sin debt. And Peter, even earlier in this letter, says he died once for all. It was a sufficient payment for your past sin and your present sin and your future sin. Sufficient payment. Nothing can be and nothing needs to be added to that. And it's not by your efforts. It's not by your adding to that. But what happened when it was a sufficient payment, when the debt was satisfied? You came to a right standing before God. You were, here's the, here's the legal term, it's the accounting term, you were justified. In a sense, it, we use it in the accounting term, that the accounts were settled. Zero balance. The accounts are settled. There's nothing guilty, nothing owing, nothing lacking. In a legal sense... You are declared to be right. You're not on probation. You are declared to be right. And in that right standing before God, you have all of the rights and privileges of one who is right before God. Which brings us to the next part of that understanding. Here's what the grace of God did for you. The grace of God restored you to what you were created to be. I'll see, this should begin to thrill our hearts restored you to what you were created to be. 
Do you realize that you were created for eternity? You were created to enjoy eternity. Death is abnormal. You kind of get a sense of that. Why is death fearful? Why do we fear death? Even in Christ, even though I know that heaven is waiting for me, even though I know that, uh, that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for me, that is waiting for me, even though I know that, just that prospect of death is still a little bit scary. For some more than others, for those outside of Christ, it's terrifying. You know why? Because it's abnormal. We might look at it this way. At the core of our being, we know that death is not what should be. You know why there is death? Because there was sin. We weren't made to be temporary. We weren't made to be under the condemnation of death. We were made for eternity, and we were made for that relationship with God. We were made for relationship with God. All the way at the beginning, we go back to the book of Genesis, and we read, and God said, let us make man in our image. Now, who, who is us and who is our? It's the Holy Spirit. It's Christ the Son. It's the triune God living in perfect relational community for all eternity. And says, now, here's what we're going to do. Let's make man in our image. Let's make man to enjoy relationship with us. Not that we become the fourth member of the Trinity. Get that straight. But God says, I want them to enjoy relationship with me. That's why we created. That's why we are created, to enjoy relationship with God. But we understand, sin spoiled that. When sin entered creation, that relationship was spoiled. And the holiness of God couldn't deny or dismiss our sin, couldn't pretend it didn't happen, couldn't overlook it for the sake of relationship. The relationship was spoiled, and yet God kept loving us. And when Jesus died on the cross, the relationship was restored. Here's the wonder that we should just continually thrill to. That when Jesus died on the cross, it was sufficient payment for our debt. But it wasn't just the fact that the, the debt was erased and now we're off on our own. The debt was erased and we're brought back to relationship. We think of it in those relational terms that our sin made us enemies of God. But when Jesus died, the grace of God was applied. No longer are we enemies, but he brings us near and he calls us his own. He calls us his children. It restored us to relationship. Now, why is that important? Well, for a lot of reasons it's important, but one of the things that I want you to understand is this is the foundation, this is the basis of our true understanding of our value and worth. What makes you valuable? Where do you find your sense of worth? Where do you find your identity? See, if we follow the world's philosophy, your worth is in what you can accumulate. Your worth is in what you've accomplished. Your worth is in the name that you've made for yourself. But that's a false measure. The measure of your value and worth is the fact that you are a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Your worth is the fact that you belong to God and you've been restored to relationship with Him. And you know, that's one of the aspects that we need to grab a hold of as, as tightly as we can. That my worth is not in what I can do. My worth is not my social status. My worth is not in my economic status. My worth is the fact that I belong to God. And belonging to God, God has declared how much I'm worth. He declared I'm worth so much he was willing to send his own son to die in my place. That's the foundation of our worth. That's the foundation of our status. That's the foundation of our, our value think we struggle with that mightily. If we grab a hold of that, we could enjoy what God desires for us. You know what else God did? The grace of God did. He made you new. The grace of God made you a new creation. If any man is in Christ, Paul wrote, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things have become new. That sinful person that you used to be, not just redone, it's not just remodeled. That sinful person is dead and buried and now alive is something new in Christ. And being new in Christ, we have to understand this. That death is no longer, or sin is no longer your master. 
Here's what we need to, to realize. And again, we need to grab a hold of this. Sin is no longer your master. You don't have to obey sin. You don't have to live under that paradigm of sin. Now, we struggle, and we'll continue to struggle because we live in a world dominated with sin, but it doesn't have to be your master anymore. And in fact, when we think about that, we realize that the old values, the old priorities, the old way of thinking apart from Christ, that just doesn't fit anymore. And God is at work in you, changing you and transforming you and conforming you to the image of his son. And the more that he does that, the more you realize that those old values don't fit. The way that you thought outside of Christ, it doesn't fit anymore. The things that you thought was going to bring you happiness and joy and fullness, they don't fit. They don't bring you those things. They never did, but you realize more and more that's not where it is. The thing that you counted on to, to be a statement of your value and worth, you realize it's not it. And he's changing you. Those old ways, those old values, they just don't fit. And I cannot live in them anymore. Salvation isn't by what we do, but because we are saved, it changes what we do. And the more God is at work in your life, teaching, shaping, guiding, molding, you realize, I can't live that way anymore. Those are the old values. Those are the old priorities. They just don't fit any th anymore, and I can't live the way I once did. Being conformed to the image of Christ and being new, we begin to realize more and more that we're living in an upside-down world. We used to think upside-down was normal. But the more we know Christ, the more we realize the way things ought to be. The more we realize the way things were created to be. That's why I love that, that hymn that we sang earlier. See if I can get the words right. His for only, ever, only his. But part of the statement says, um, earth above a softer blue uh, no I can't get it I can't get the words right but, but it's, it, the, the catchphrase is something lives in every hue that Christless eyes have never seen so in, in Christ I begin to see things as they really are I begin to see things as they were meant to be and I realize that this world is upside down and that's not normal and my values change and when my values change my actions change and when my actions change, I look like Christ. And here's the thing to realize. And here's the thing that I think Peter is driving to. We can't love the world anymore. We can't love the world and the things of the world. In fact, we, we try, and, and here's the misconception of the gospel, that I can love Jesus, and I can love the Bible, and I can love all that the world has to offer me. And if I love Jesus, then it kind of supplements all that the world has to offer me. And I can enjoy those things because I have Jesus. Here's the truth. You can't love the world and the things the world offers. You can't love the values of the world and pursue those th same things. You have to live differently. And as you live differently, the world's going to take notice. And as the world takes notice, they're going to hate you. You will be hated by the world. Paul said it just pretty clearly when he wrote to Timothy. Though all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The world's going to hate you. You can't be a friend of the world, and you can't be a friend of God. Now, you can love the world and minister to the world and desire to bring them into relationship with God, but you can't be like the world. And I think that's where we struggle, especially in our Western Christianity. We want to be just like the world with our Christian covering. I think we've got it all. But Peter's saying that's not what the gospel is. That's not the true grace of God. True grace of God isn't being your best self. True grace of God is being what God created you to be, which is much better than your best self. It's being what God created you to be. Now, in being restored to relationship, other relationships are impacted by that. Families are benefited. Communities are benefited when we turn to Christ. But it's not simply a strategy to make your family better. This is the relationship that you were created to live in. And when you, create, when you live in that relationship that you were created to live in, then you see your life being where it should be. It's not a promise of ease and luxury. It's not a promise of, of no problems, of smooth sailing. But it is what God has 
desired for you so that you can know the full measure of his goodness. That's the true grace of God. That's why Peter wrote the letter. That's why we want to proclaim that. A gospel that's much richer than life will be better. It's what God has intended for you. I say that for a couple reasons. There may be some here who have never embraced that. Still living under that old paradigm. Still trying to figure out what brings fullness and meaning to life. It's not religion. It's not church attendance. It's relationship with Jesus Christ that's being restored through the forgiveness of your sins. And if you've never just cried out to God and said, God, let that death count for me. Let me know your full measure, uh, the full measure of your goodness and your grace. Embrace me as your child. If you've never done that, then this would be a good day to do it. That's the gospel. It's not a promise of easiness, but it is a promise of eternity. Maybe you've done that, and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, but you're trying to do both. You're trying to be a follower of Jesus and enjoy all that the world has to offer. To realize that's not what the gospel is and that's not what the grace of God is. And at that point, just to say, God, you direct my life. You shape me. You change me. You conform me to your image. And where I need to put off, by your grace, let me put it off. And where I need to put on, by your grace, let me put it on. So that every day I reflect who you are. I look more and more like Jesus and less and less like the world. And when you do that, you understand the grace and the goodness and the blessing that are far greater than temporary circumstances. Believer, if that's where you are, then maybe just spend some time before God saying, I confess that, and I want you to shape my life as you would shape my life. Father, today, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the truth that before your throne, we have a great high priest who intercedes for us. We, we thank you that before your throne, there is one who has nail scars in his hand because of us, marks of your love for us. We thank you that before your throne, we are counted perfect because the one who is perfect died in our place. Father, we want our lives to reflect that always. So by your grace, by your strength, let us put off things that, that don't look like Jesus. Let us put off the things that the, the areas where we clamor to look like the world so that we might follow you and enjoy the full measure of your goodness. And mostly, Father, we thank you for your love and your patience with us, knowing that your love isn't based on our performance. But because you love us, we want to love you and demonstrate that with a whole heart. So be at work in us. And Father, all of this we pray in Jesus' name.